Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In today's episode, I'm finally going to get serious about documenting the functions I have been writing for my Philotyper package. Now, don't get scared off when I tell you what Philotyper does, because the odds are good that most of you have no need for using Philotyper. Philotyper will allow one to classify 16S rRNA gene sequences to a bacterial or archaeal or eukaryotic taxonomic lineage, right? And so, again, you may not know about this or understand this or care about this, but the odds are good that if you're watching this, you're interested in making packages in R. I have been following along this R Packages book by Hadley Wickham and Jenny Bryan. You can find a link to it up, up here in the corner. But what I'm going to focus on today is part of Part 5 documentation. So it's Chapter 16 on Function Documentation. And so we're going to go through a variety of tools and tricks that we can use to document our R functions in this Philotyper package. Again, you will need to do this type of thing even if you're not writing something to classify something as esoteric as a gene sequence. All R packages um, have documentation. Those packages that get used the most have fantastic documentation. And trust me when I say, you want to have fantastic documentation. Documentation is not easy. I would say it's not fun <laughs> to write because what's obvious to you is not always obvious to the person that's going to be using your code. Try to put yourself in the position of someone using your function and what type of information they need to most effectively use your functions. If you're like me, you find things like a description of uh, the function useful, perhaps references that are put in there, uh, perhaps links to other bits of information, and most importantly, are the examples. I have learned so much about how to use a function by following the examples. So we will be sure to put examples into our functions. Documentation also isn't fun to write because it's just generally boring and dry. Um, if you've read documentation I've written for other things like my mother uh, pa package, uh, you'll know that I get a little bit slap happy at some times and start to kind of infuse a bit of sarcasm along the way. I will try not to do that uh, as we go through documenting Philotyper. As always, if you want to get the code that I'm working with here today, down below in the description, there's a link to uh, a GitHub repository for what this repository looks like right now <laughs> as I'm talking to you. There will also be a link for what things look like at the end. So writing documentation is also pretty boring to watch someone else do. So I'm going to kind of um, accelerate the process a bit and maybe hide some of that writing from you. And so again, that might be where it's useful to get what the repository looks like at the end if you're trying to follow along. But what I'll try to do is pull out those bits of information that are more generalizable, right? Like you don't perhaps care what a taxonomy file is so much, but perhaps you do care about how you can use different bits of information, or the same bits of information in different functions, right? So I'll try to kind of highlight those things as I go along, and hopefully it won't look too much like a Frankenstein's monster kind of cobbled together. Anyway, so let's go into our R directory, and you'll find here in my R directory that I have uh, five different R scripts or R files, right? One is RCPP exports. That's for a C++ function that I had written. There's also a read taxonomy.r. So this is for the read taxonomy function. There's a read fast a function. Um, there's also a philotyper package um, that I think also has something to do with RCPP, writing C++ code. So I don't worry about that right now. But there's also this kmers.r file that has, I think, four functions in it. Generally, we try to put one function per r file. So I'm going to leave two in here because the two depend on common code that's also within the script. But if you come down in here, you'll find that I have a couple of functions in here. Uh, where are they? So they would be like filter taxonomy and print taxonomy that don't depend on anything else in kmers.r. So I'm going to pull those out into a separate file. So that's one layer of documentation, right? So that we know that if I'm looking for a function like filter taxonomy, that the first place I might look is filter taxonomy.r. So we'll go ahead and I'll use the console to do use underscore r, and I'll do filter taxonomy.r. I'll also do use test filter taxonomy. Uh, you don't need the dot r, oh, but you do need quotes around it. Sorry about that. And so this then will create a filter taxonomy.r, which is blank, 
and test-filter taxonomy.r, this test file is stored in the tests directory. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this uh, filter taxonomy, and I'll go ahead and cut that out and plop that in here into my filter taxonomy.r. I'll go ahead and save that. I'm also going to open up use test kmers, um, and that should also get me all of the tests that were written for the kmers file, right? And so again, what we're looking for is filter taxonomy, and that is this block here, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and grab this test uh, and cut that out and paste it into test filter taxonomy.r, replacing what I had there. Go ahead and save this and test. That all passed. Wonderful. Um, we'll go ahead and close that for now, close that um, the, the filter taxonomy, and we'll now think about print taxonomy. So we'll do the same type of thing again. So I'll do use r print underscore taxonomy, and I'll do use test print taxonomy. Okay. Again, what I'm doing is trying to break apart my code to put it into more logical units. So again, in here, we'll take our print taxonomy, Go ahead and cut that out and paste that in here into print taxonomy.r. I'll go ahead and save that. So here in my test kmers.r file, I have a test for printing, printing out the consensus taxonomy. I'll go ahead and cut that. And then we'll go ahead and put that into our test print taxonomy. Save and test to make sure it all works still. Good. Moving things around didn't break anything. One thing I noticed is that down here I have a function classify sequence that I'm gonna go ahead and cut and move to the top of this script. Uh, I like to put the heavy hitting functions, if you will, up at the top and more of the utility functions further down. So kmers.r now has build kmer database as a function, as well as classify sequence as a function. And I'm keeping those together in the same file because they use a lot of the same functions, right? So like this detect kmers is a function that's defined further down in here, um, right there actually. Um, but that's also used in my build kmer database function, right? So I wanna keep those together. I suppose I could probably put the, make three files. And so here you kind of get into a difficult situation, right? Do we keep things together or do we split things apart? For now, I'm gonna keep things together. And uh, you let me know what you think down below in the comments, what you would go about doing. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead for now and close my kmers.r and my test kmers.r, and I am going to start because, and because I have it open, I'm going to go ahead and start with documenting print taxonomy.r. So when I initially had documented this, I used the no rd tag, and what that means is don't provide any documentation, don't export this function for general usage. But I actually do want it to be useful for general usage. If you're using a Phylotyper, I want you to be able to see print taxonomy because I want you to be able to print out the taxonomy. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that tag. This tag, again, with the pound and the apostrophe is a Roxygen tag. And so we're gonna be using a lot of Roxygen as we go through here today to document our functions. So to create what's called a skeleton or kind of the framework for our documentation, in our studio, if I keep my cursor within the body of the function, I can come up here to code and then do insert Roxygen skeleton. It's got a whole bunch of finger twister keystroke. I'm just going to use this. Uh, and here you go. It pops up with a framework or a skeleton of what the documentation should look like. You'll notice here that there are two um, param parameters for consensus and, and levels. These are the arguments that I already have in here. Um, and so the nice thing about the skeleton is that it, it figures out what the arguments are that need to be documented. The other thing that it has in here is an export I'm going to actually move this to the end because I'm going to want to have examples um, at the end and then follow that with export. And I want it to be easy to see the export so that I can see that it's actually getting exported from the package. The other thing we'll change is this return to make it returns, right? And so if you look at the documentation for at return, it says superseded in favor of at returns. So we'll go ahead and add in that at returns. It also then has a title. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And then let's go ahead and document. And we see we get a whole bunch of error messages, which is fine. <laughs> and then to get the help, we can do question mark print taxonomy. This will then open up the help page such as it is currently, right? And so we can see then that it's got um, a title that's title, right? That's that there. 
and then it's got a param consensus and param n levels. Um, for whatever reason, it's only showing the end levels. It's not showing the consensus. Uh, and so that's not good, right? And then it shows kind of the example of the usage. So we wanna go ahead and fill this out, right? And so the title I will use will be print taxonomy for an unknown sequence. And again, if I save and then document, and then we can kind of refresh this, we now see that we have a title in here and it also has a description that it is copying from the title. So if you wanna put in a different description than the title, what you can do is create a separate text body below the title. So I'll say the print taxonomy function will output the consensus taxonomy for an unknown uh, sequence with confidence scores for each taxonomic level and each taxonomic level separated by semicolon. So again, if we save and document, refresh this, we now see that we get a description here. I see I've also misspelled taxonomy. Um, something else we might like to do is go ahead and wrap this function name or any kind of code in backticks. And so that's a convention from Markdown. If we then go ahead and save that, and again, uh, document, and refresh here, we see that corrected my misspelling of taxonom to taxonomy, but it's converted my backticks into apostrophes and it's not rendering it as markdown. So to get it to use markdown, what I need to do is come back to my description file and under my Roxygen note here on my line 18, I'm gonna go ahead and put Roxygen and then we'll do a colon list and we'll then do markdown equals true. And so I think that should do the trick to tell Roxygen to convert Markdown into Markdown, okay? And so now we go ahead and document that and we come back to our help and refresh here. And so now we see that print taxonomy is in a, a monospace font. That is the convention that we use for representing code. And so anywhere that we incorporate um, Markdown, Roxygen now will convert that into the proper format. And so it'll make things look a bit more attractive. So now we wanna think about our parameters. And so again, by default, it'll put at param and then the, the argument name, so it knows the argument names. And so then after that argument name, I can go ahead and put a description of what that parameter is. So I'm gonna go ahead and describe the type of object that it is and what that object contains. So I'll say a list object that contains two slots each with an equal, um, let's tab over to make things kind of justified a little bit, equal sized vector, and I have mis added a typo there, all right. Um, the, let's see, what are the different slots? So we have taxonomy and confidence, okay. So the taxonomy vector contains the uh, classification, all right, um, at each taxonomic level. All right, and so again, we can put taxonomy in backticks and the confidence uh, vector contains the fraction of bootstraps that had the specified uh, classification. So I've purposely written this off the right side of the screen uh, to show something that's kind of cool about the tools is that I could go through and kind of wherever I have this vertical line on my screen and hit enter. Alternatively, what is a bit easier to do is to highlight those lines and then go to code and then reflow comment. And so then this will automatically reflow the comment for me, making things a lot easier to work with, okay? And so that's a nice description for my consensus argument. If nothing else, it's a good first draft, right? All right, so now we have end levels and I'm gonna go ahead and put this um, kind of justified again with consensus and I'll say an integer that uh, indicates the number of taxonomic levels, taxonomic levels to expect for each sequence. So I'll say default equals six uh, and yeah, that'll be good. 
And so again, we can get Roxygen uh, or get RStudio to reflow this for us. Um, and again, I kind of like having things justified like that. All right. And so again, we can save this and we can document. Uh, the book uh, really recommends updating document and updating our view of the documentation frequently to get a sense of how things look. And so this is looking pretty good so far, right? Um, and so now what does it return, right? Returns a character string indicating the classification at each taxonomic level with the corresponding confidence in parentheses. Um, each taxonomic level is separated by a semicolon. Right, and again, we can reflow this. And this is probably something I should learn how to do. So it's uh, control shift forward slash, control shift forward slash. So now we turn to the examples field. So CRAN expects to see examples for each of your functions. Uh, there's kind of ways around that, but more and more my understanding is that CRAN has been kind of checking out uh, what people are doing to make sure people are providing examples. Again, examples are really critical to helping your user understand how to use your function. I'm gonna grab my examples from my test code. So again, this is another wonderful reason to have tests because we can use those tests to get back um, example code that we can use. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy these uh, lines four through 10 and I'll plop them in here in examples. So basically what happens here um, in this code is I have a, a variable, uh, a list <laughs> called oscillosporaceae and again, it's a list with taxonomy and confidence, right? And maybe what I'll do is go ahead and add in some line breaks here uh, to make things look attractive. And we then uh, need to put in that comment. All right, so we'll get that going over. And again, just to make things look attractive, we'll do that. And then I'll go ahead and remove the expected and bring up the print taxonomy. And let's get that looking good. And so then we'll save that. Um, one thing to know about the examples is that when CRAN builds your package, they run the examples. And so the examples have to work. Um, so they have to work. And <laughs> number two, you do not want to depend on pinging um, some remote resource, like something on the web, right? And also the data that you use has to be contained within the package itself. And so that's why I'm not using something big like the train set that we've been using to develop our, our, our vignette, our article, right? And so that's another reason to use these tests because I know the tests work and they're gonna execute pretty quickly. So again, in my console here, I can do document, refresh this, and then we see we've got our arguments, the value, and then our example uh, down here at the bottom. And because I've got kind of things blown up a little bit so you can see things easier, my example looks um, a little bit funky, but hopefully that makes sense, okay? So this is what we've done for print taxonomy. Great, that's one function out of the way. I'm now going to turn to uh, the filter taxonomy. So we'll do use our uh, filter taxonomy, and I'll also go ahead and grab use test filter taxonomy, and I need my quotes around that, but not too many quotes. All right, so now we have those two files open. And again, I'm gonna do largely the same thing that I did with print taxonomy, putting my cursor inside the body of the function, going to code, inserting Roxygen skeleton, boom, there it is. And then my title will be filter uh, taxonomy. And then I'm going to have a description and then I'll say the filter taxonomy uh, function will filter a consensus taxonomy to remove any taxonomic levels where the confidence score is below a minimum or min uh, confidence. Okay, good. Um, we've got our nice mark down there and then we've got our classification, our min confidence. So something that occurs to me that in print taxonomy, I used consensus and in filter taxonomy, I've got classification. And classification um, 
has is basically the same thing, except it's been um, it's going to get filtered, right? And so I could imagine using print taxonomy on something that hasn't been filtered, right? And so I'd like to use the same argument name in both of my functions. So I'm going to go ahead and filter taxonomy and change classification into consensus to match what I have in print taxonomy. Kind of like that uh, name as an argument better anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and change classification to cons consensus. Let's see if it actually works the way I've done it here. I'll go ahead and test that. And it passes. Wonderful. Cool. All right. That's a relief that that passes. And so again, the benefit here is that we've got a common uh, consensus, a common argument name between print taxonomy and filter taxonomy. So I'd rather not have to rewrite the parameter definition for consensus since I already have it here in print taxonomy. I'd rather only have to update it in one place. So what I can do is instead of param, I can do inherit, um, is it params? Yeah, inherit params from print underscore taxonomy. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this. Um, and I'll go ahead and do a document. And then we'll do uh, filter taxonomy. All right. And so now if we look at here, uh, we see that we've got consensus and it's brought over the text that was used in print taxonomy over here into the help for filter taxonomy. So that's cool, right? So again, the benefit here is that I've got this text that is perhaps going to get updated over and over um, as I kind of go through the development of this package. All right, so now I need to define the min confidence parameter. And so I'll say the minimum fraction of bootstrap replicates that had, let's see, justify this, <laughs> the same classification, any confidence score below this value will have the corresponding taxonomy removed, okay? All right, and so then we're going to return um, a list, so a list object, containing two equally uh, sized vectors that are filtered to remove low confidence taxonomies. So we'll say one vector, and what's one vector? Uh, taxonomy and the other is confidence. So we'll say taxonomy. Uh, can uh, let's say contains the uh, taxonomy uh, at each taxonomic level, and the other vector. I'll put commas here, uh, and we'll say confidence contains the uh, confidence score for that taxonomy. And there is a little bit of overlap, I would say, here um, uh, between this and um, probably what we're going to have for a consensus. But I think the, the thing that I'll add here is that um, there will be no um, uh, taxonomies or confidence scores below min uh, confidence. And so we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and move export down below examples. And then for examples, we'll grab that from our test. And I'll go ahead and grab some of this code and then clean it up a bit. Um, and we'll kind of justify everything under the at sign, right? All right. And let's tab this all over. Let's see, there's that. And our confidence goes there, okay. All right, and so then the code that we're running is this filter taxonomy. Good. So that should work, and then we're going to export this as I said. So let's go ahead and document on this, and then we'll go ahead and do question mark, filter taxonomy, 
that we again have our title, the description, the usage, the arguments, the value, and the examples that anybody could run to see how to use filter taxonomy. Very good. All right. So now that's filter taxonomy. We've got two of our six functions out of the way. Ah, wonderful. All right. So let's come back to our files to remind ourselves of what else we need to document. So we have done um, print taxonomy and filter taxonomy. And so now we can think about our read fast day and our read taxonomy. I'll go ahead now to our read fast day. And we've already done an import of the Roxygen. And I think I did this to make sure that I was importing things. I'm gonna go ahead and start by moving that export down to the bottom here. So a lot of this is going to be duplication of what we've seen in um, the two previous functions we've worked on. So I'm gonna go ahead and wave my magic wand and fill in this information. So this was me waving my magic wand. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out um, is that the book, the R Packages book, Jenny Bryan and Hadley Wickham make a good point of emphasizing to look at what other people do for their documentation. Um, that you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. So you can look through your favorite packages, you can look through GitHub and kind of see what people have done. What I did was I borrowed some text from the read underscore TSV uh, function from the read R package to kind of articulate a little bit what I was trying to get at here, right? And I updated this a little bit to modify um, that we're containing DNA sequences in the standard FASTA format. I point out there's no checks to determine whether the DNA or the data are DNA or amino acid sequences. Perhaps that's an indication we should think about testing for that and perhaps, um, yeah, testing for that for our audience. But for now, I'm gonna roll with this. Um, I also indicate the different return value as well as my examples, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and run document on this to see what this looks like. And then we'll go ahead and then do read fast A and let's see what this looks like. And so what I'm noticing is that it is using Markdown <laughs> for my file um, argument here, right? And so what I did was to tab over or space over from the file argument and then to kind of justify both uh, blocks of text with that, right? And so then if you've got like, uh, I think it's two or four spaces for a block, it's gonna put that as if it's code, right? And so what we could do instead is go ahead and put these as their own lines. Um, let's see, uh, their, their own uh, to kind of, to write justify them, right? And then if we put a line break in between them, we can then go ahead and reflow the comment. And so now we have two paragraphs and it's below the param file line. So if I go ahead and save that and then do document, now we see that it's much nicer formatted, okay? One other thing we can do is that we see that there's these different fields in here, right? There's the description, the usage, arguments, value, examples, right? Um, you can also put in notes, right? And so what I'm gonna put in here then is a note. So I'll do at note. And so you can, it says you can add an optional note, now generally superseded using a level one markdown heading. Um, I'm not totally sure what that means um, about the now generally superseded part, I'm gonna run with note um, and maybe I'll put text under it and I'll say the sequences in the FASTA uh, file can have uh, line breaks within them and a uh, fast, a uh, read FASTA will put those separate lines into the same sequence, okay? So we can go ahead and clean that up a little bit and I'll go ahead and run document and then update that, we see note. One other thing that we could think about doing is put a reference to what a standard FASTA formatted file is. So I'll go ahead and do a search for a FASTA format, uh, some type of reference like that, maybe a Wikipedia article like this. Um, and so I'll go ahead and grab that. And what we can do then is use a link for a markdown. And so that is two square braces around the text. And then the in the parentheses next to that is the link that you wanna send that text to, right? So if we go ahead and save that and document, we now see that we have given a standard FASTA formatted file, blah, 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 right? And I think if I click on this, bam, it takes us right to that file, right? So that's pretty slick, I'd say. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that. And now let's think about read taxonomy. And so we'll do use R, read 
read taxonomy. And this opens this. Again, we have a bit of a skeleton in here already. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that export align down towards the bottom. And we'll see that we have that file argument again. Again, a lot of the same stuff that we've been seeing with the previous functions. So I'm gonna go ahead, put in some text and jump ahead. So again, a lot of the same stuff. I'm gonna come back to uh, Google and in my mother uh, wiki, I have a link to um, a taxonomy file page that kind of roughly describes what the taxonomy file looks like. So I'll go ahead and grab this and I'll insert this as a link here, right? And go ahead and save that. And then we'll go ahead and do document to see that that works. And so we'll go ahead and do read taxonomy. And so there we go. We have our pretty nice <laughs> appearing help page and I'm pretty, pretty happy with how that looks. So now I'm ready to turn to the, um, the two functions that are in kmers.r. I think that's the only thing I haven't changed yet. So again, we have classify seek as well as build kmer database. Build kmer database already has a lot of um, the built in stuff that we've been talking about along the way. Um, I'm gonna give it a title. This is more of a description, I would say. Um, and so here I'll say build kmer database and that's good. Um, let's go ahead. Um, and so now looking through this, I see that I have a TBD object. And so here I'll say a list object uh, because when I wrote this, I didn't quite know what the output was going to look like. And so it's a list with um, conditional probability and the genera. Um, yeah, so conditional level uh, probability. And so maybe in here I will put um, the name of that slot. And so that's conditional uh, prob, right? And I'll put that in parentheses to kind of just be descriptive of, of seeing each kmer uh, in a given genus as well as the genus name. Uh, all right, and so then the genus names is getting stored in the genera slot, okay? Cool. And I think that all looks good. And I need an example, right? And so let's go ahead and add that. Uh, and we'll do at examples, examples. Uh, it's examples with an S at the end. And here for my example code, I'm gonna go and do use test with kmers. And again, that needs to be in quotes. Uh, and I made the mistake of putting a question mark before that, I've been doing that. All right, and so then this again, that we're working on is the build kmer database function. And so um, I've got this here. So I'll go ahead and grab these five lines of code, plop that in here, remove those uh, leading spaces, and let's get this cleaned up. And there we go, cool. And we can remove some of these lines, I think. So let's go ahead and do that. Save and then document and then build kmer database and see what this looks like. I think one thing that I will put in here is a reference. Um, and so sometimes when you're using an algorithm or a method that is based on something in the scientific literature, it's helpful to put a reference to where you're getting this from. And so we'll do references. And then again, below that, I will put in blocks indicating the references kind of like in bibliometric uh, format. And so here I will go ahead to PubMed and I will look for naive Bayesian classifier. And here we go, uh, naive Bayesian classifier. That's the paper that we're working off of here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this site button and I'll go ahead and copy this and then plop that in here uh, into my references. And I'll go ahead and then have it reformat, reflow the comment and that will be all good. Uh, maybe for this DOI, I will go ahead and put in a hyperlink to that. Um, and let's see, get this looking right. And so the hyperlink for a DOI, I don't know why I know this, but HTTPS uh, dx.doi.org forward slash and then the DOI. And so we can go ahead and save and then document, and we can then do help on build kmer database. And so now we see our references is right here. 
Clicking on that brings us to show that this is the correct page. I think one thing I'll do is maybe remove some of this information from NCBI. I don't know that anyone's really gonna care when it was EPUBed um, or anything like that. Maybe they do care about the PMET ID. So we'll leave that in. Cool. All right. So that then is the build camer database function. The only thing we have left to do then is our classify sequence. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill in a lot of this information. Great, so now I have documentation for the classify seeks function. Should go ahead and have parentheses there to make it clear that this is a function. Um, go ahead and, ahead and referencing the wing it all naive Bayesian classifier algorithm, right? Um, and one thing I noticed as I was writing the documentation that I didn't wanna miss sharing with you all is that I have a parameter called unknown and that what I noticed was in my function definition I have unknown equals unknown sequence and database equals DB. That seems weird. So I think what I wanna have is the argument be unknown sequence without a default and database without a default, okay? So let's go ahead and we did uh, update the parameter further up here to be unknown sequence. And then our test KMERS is probably going to fail. Um, and so, yeah, here I have uh, this unknown should be unknown sequence. Let's see, that sh Let's see if that passes. Nope, it didn't pass, of course. <laughs> ah. um, let's see, error here, object unknown not found. All right, so let's go back to our kmers.r and let's look to see where we have unknown. Um, and so here I have unknown equals unknown sequence. So I'll go ahead and put unknown sequence there. And then I have sequence equals unknown here. So that should be unknown sequence. I'll go ahead and save and test again. Great, that passed. I did put in my reference here, but I realized I didn't put in the hyperlink. And so I could come back up to my build camera database, copy this, paste it down below. But it seems to me there should be an easier way or a better way, I don't know if it's easier, um, of getting these references. And it's gonna kind of riff off of the idea that we saw before with the inherit params. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out and we'll go ahead and insert in here, inherit, and then we'll inherit from the source and the components. So the source is going to be build camera database and the component we want is the references. Okay, so we'll go ahead and save that. Let's go ahead and document it. Do classify sequence. Yep, I've got the E. We now see that we've got that hyperlink and we're in good shape. Um, and so now again, if we update uh, build camera database, the reference here, it'll then get updated here. I guess we could test that, right? So let's go ahead and remove uh, all of this PubMed information. I'll go ahead and save that. And then let's do document. So again, that was modifying build camera databases references. And we're looking to see if it gets propagated into classify sequences. Date, um, classify sequence is um, references. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. And sure enough, it got truncated. I kind of like having that PMID and PMCID number. So I'll go ahead and leave that. Uh, let's go ahead and document. We've got it. Good. So we've, I think, now updated all of the documentation. I'm no longer getting errors when I run document. One way to check all this, um, well, let's first run test to make sure all our, yep, everything passes. We can then run the check function to make sure everything passes like it would if we were to go ahead and have CRAN check it out. Wonderful, that ran without any errors, no warnings, no notes, and that is wonderful. And now we have all sorts of great documentation for our, our, our Philotyper package and all the functions that are in there, all of them, there's six, right? So that's really good. We're making progress, getting towards the point of being ready to submit our package to CRAN there's a few more things that we have to do along the way. I'd also like to kind of use it for maybe a very small project and kick the tires and, and see how it performs to make sure it really works the way I would like it to work in the easiest possible way for how I think people would often use, um, use, use this package to classify uh, their unknown sequences. So that you don't miss the next episode when we keep marching along towards that goal, please make sure you subscribe to the channel, tell your friends about what we're doing here on Code Club, and I'll see you next time for another episode.